Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to a CAA webinar. Today's session is being hosted by the Caribbean Natural Association Social Security Subcommittee, and today's topic is on Social Security around the region and the response to COVID-19, what lies ahead. Before we get started, some brief housekeeping. Um, all participants are on mute throughout the session. If you have any questions for the panelists, we would like you to submit those via the Q&A window. Post-webinar, any presentations and recordings will be made available to all attendees via the CAA's website, YouTube page, and also on Attribute. This event is being recorded. The recording is the sole property of the CAA and may be uploaded in its entirety to the, our website, social media, otherwise shared at the sole discretion of the CAA. Thank you very much for joining today's session. You can also follow our pages on social media. We are on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook, and you can search for Caribbean Actual Association. I'll now hand over to Judy Vera to introduce today's, um, the panelists for today's session. Over to you, Judy. Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, you're seeing my video, right? Pedro? Yep. Okay, great. Right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Pedro. Um, yeah, so we have with us today the Social CAA Social Security Subcommittee. Um, we have Amanda Darville, uh, who is with the NIB of Bahamas. We have Tammy Clark in Barbados. She's a pension consultant with um, ECLA. We have Simon Balkisun, uh, Lifeworks, Trinidad slash Canada. I like to think of her that way. And of course, Derek Osborne, who is our the chair of the Social Security Subcommittee, also Bahamas slash Canada, uh, partner and senior actuary at LifeWoods, and myself, Judy Vera, who would be leading most of the presentation. Um, let me just minimize that. So whilst I am going through, I think Pedro is going to do just one or two little uh, surveys just to get us started. Pedro, should I wait until you finish that? Um, yes, so the first quick question was just to ask everyone where did they first hear about today's webinar? Yeah. Okay, I'll end the poll in three, two, one. Okay, actually a few responses coming in there. Okay, great, I'll end the poll now and share the results. And you can see majority of the persons uh, found out via um, an email from the CAA. Um, next was being word of mouth and in terms of social media, LinkedIn was the most popular platform. So thanks everyone for the feedback. Over to you, Judy. Right, what, you, you're gonna, what about the other two um, poll questions, Pedro? Yep, so I'll ask the next question. So we also want to get an idea of where you're joining us from. Are you from Barbados, Bahamas, the Eastern Caribbean, Jamaica, Trinidad, or other? Okay, so I think most persons have responded, so I'll end the poll now and share those results. Um, so most persons are from none of the identified countries or regions. Um, when we drill down more, we have a large contingent from Barbados, almost a quarter of attendees. I'm very proud of my Bajans for being here. Um, then we have a fifth of the persons being from Jamaica, 40% of the audience from Trinidad, and 4% from the Bahamas. And then the final poll that we'll launch, we want to get a sense of what industry um, you're currently in. So the options are social security, pensions, life insurance, regulatory or other. Yep. All right. 
right so i think most persons have responded so end the poll now and share the results so majority of the persons um, are in pensions um, we have about a quarter of persons not in any of the industries identified um, that have a good contingent in both life insurance and regulatory. So you have a good spread of persons joining today's session. Great. Yeah. Right. Thanks very much for that, Pedro. So yes, as you said, we have a widespread across, across areas of practice and throughout the region. So what we're going to do this afternoon is sort of give you an overview of comparing the various social security schemes around the region. You may hear me say use the term interchangeably between social security and national insurance. Different countries use one or two of either one of those terminologies. So I will tend to use both, okay? Um, it'll be a very overview comparison. And then we're gonna delve into how do these various social security schemes react, how did they handle when the COVID-19 pandemic hit all of us and what lies ahead? So the next slide. Next slide. Social security certainly is a vital pillar of social protection and the importance of social security is growing even that much more important in greater importance as time goes on. First off, you have integration with public pension plans. You have a number of them, a number of countries, sorry, in the region with their civil service pension plans, such as um, Dominica, St. Dominica, St. Lucia, um, and Grenada, where they've closed off their civil service pension plan to new employees. Um, I know St. Vincent, well, they've always had it on the table. They keep talking about it. Maybe they may eventually join the bandwagon and do something similar. Because what has happened, if you don't make those changes, certainly um, in some of these countries as St. Vincent, you would have people could effectively retire with over 100% of their salary. They, by the time they collect their social security benefit plus the civil service um, pension benefit. So clearly that is financially um, not sustainable. Um, there are many people who do not have access to a private pension plan. All they rely on is their pension from social security. So it really is critical for them. You find a number of employers too, they are maybe feeling a little bit tired or um, bogged down with increased compliance uh, with the regulators, the administrative expense, record keeping, um, doing the valuations and some of them, you know, this is just one thing they just don't want to be bothered and some of them are either simply will not introduce a private pension plan or are thinking about phasing out their private pension plan. And of course you have that gap between your retirement age from your private employer and then you have to stick around a little bit later to be able to collect your social security pension, assuming you wait until the normal retirement age. Um, so this is really critical social security and we must all be concerned about it. Then you sometimes you may ask yourself, is, there, is it possible for us to have regionally a uniform social security design where all of us, we're all Caribbean people, can we get one thing right across the board? I think that really would be challenging if not impossible. You have various countries have different levels of funded status. Some may be looking down the road right now where their reserve levels may be projected to be depleted, maybe within the next five, seven years. You may have others that may be not as mature and their reserves are projected to be depleted. Maybe they have another good 15 um, years before that happens. So they all are at um, different stages of ensuring their long-term financial sustainability and should they increase their benefits to what extent, I'm sorry, reduce benefits and to what extent or similarly stepping up contribution rates or any other changes. And of course, all of them, each country is faced with different political pressures. Certainly um, it is impacted by, are we in an election year? Are we close to an election year? So you may have the actuary 
make any recommendations to the board slash government. Look, these are the changes that need to be that need to be adopted within the next few years um, for your system to ensure the long-term financial sustainability of your scheme. But if it is an election year and the government, the powers that be decide, listen, this is not gonna be acceptable um, by the constituents. This might make us lose. This is gonna to have to go on the um, back burner. So all of that um, plays into it. And of course, different countries are different um, in terms of the aging of their population and low birth rates. On one extreme, you have very young countries like say, um, uh, Turks and Caicos that has 10 uh, contributors to support every pensioner. And then you have the more mature older countries such as say Trinidad, which has 2.8 contributors per pensioner. Barbados is certainly considered, if I wanna say an old, I hate to say that, old, more mature um, country with 2.4 and more mature scheme, 2.4. Um, active contributors to support every pensioner. So they're all at different stages and have their own battles to pursue. So it really would be difficult to try and get a uniform social security design. So yes, next one. So we just to give you an overview, just very broad overview in terms of key similarities, right? In general, of course, all of these national, um, all of these national insurance schemes, they're there to, um, as a safety net, to maintain your um, income during periods of economic um, inactivity. It is all about an emphasis on social adequacy, not your individual equity. A private pension plan would focus on individual equity, but this is a national social insurance plan. Um, it is all about the intergenerational transfers, transferring funds from your active contributors who are paying into the fund to support the benefit payments of your current pensioners. You have maybe those who, um, who are the, the single person, they may relatively less benefits than uh, the person who has the entire family and certainly all of them tend to be more geared to paying higher, relatively higher benefits to, to the lower income earner than the higher income earner. They all pretty much offer a comprehensive benefit package. We should all know this. You have the, on the short-term benefit side, you are offered your short-term sickness benefit, maternity benefit, maternity grants. You have funeral grants. You have your employment injury benefits, benefits, sorry. Um, and then of course your long-term benefits where you have your old age slash retirement benefit, survivors, disability, pension, sorry. So pretty much right across the region, you're gonna find that um, comprehensive benefit package. Um, in terms of the formula too, again, Pretty much, it's they all pretty much offer anywhere um, anywhere from thirty to say sixty percent of your average insurable earnings. You can get that maximum after about thirty-five to forty years of contribution weeks. They are all pretty much front-loaded. So after the first ten years of con contribution, sorry, you can get as much as thirty percent of your average insurable earnings as a possible pension. In terms of funding, of course, they all, for the short-term benefit branch and the employment injury branch, those tend to be funded on a, peer, let's say essentially a pay-as-you-go basis with a minimum level of reserves, maybe one year of reserves. The employment injury might have a little bit more, but pretty much one year of reserves. For the long-term benefit branch, that will be funded, what we would say partially funded, essentially pay as you go, but a buildup of a much greater level of reserves. The minimum level of reserves would be stipulated in the respective legislation, insurance acts or ordinance as the case may be. Um, certainly a more mature scheme would, where you know, your, your cash flow streams are much more stable and predictable, the minimum level of reserves may not necessarily be as high, 
as a younger scheme where they still are growing um, and there's still a little bit uncertain of how their cash flow and uh, expenditure stream is projected to grow. Okay, so that is generally across the board. They all pretty much um, in terms of pensioners and providing um, cost of living increases, ad hoc pension increases. It, have, it, it is done on an ad hoc manner. Typically when the valuation is done, that, that would be reviewed and determined, can we afford to give a cost of living increase to the pensioners and to what extent? There is, I have that asterisk there because Barbados is the exception in terms of that they have automatic indexing, all right? Um, all of them, they do the, they do the reviews. The actuary has to do a review um, by law every two to three years. Um, and the review is done on an open group valuation. So it looks at, it looks at the individual, the insured population from birth, they track them from track, the individual is tracked from birth, working age. So now you're contributing into the NIS. Then you reach retirement age. Now you're collecting from the NIS. And then unfortunately death you may have um, survivor benefits to continue that a little bit further. But, and that open group valuation would essentially be done um, a 50, 60 year projection of looking at your income stream, which is your contribution income and investment income versus your expenditure stream, your benefits and your administrative expenses, okay? Um, so that's a major difference between that social security schemes and private pension plans. When they do their valuations, it is a closed group valuation. Whoever is in existence, in existence at the time of the valuation date. All right. So that's one of the key differences there. In terms of again, sorry, on similarities, pretty much they all have this have signed on, sorry, to the CARICOM reciprocal agreement. And it ensures that people who are under the CSME and traveling around the region, and they're just working for a few years in country A, then a few years country B, we wanna make sure that when they reach their retirement age, um, they don't just simply qualify or eligible for a grant. So that CARICOM reciprocal agreement allows the totalization of all the contribution weeks that they've earned in all these various countries to come together so that they can be eligible for a pension. Okay, so that really is critical. They all pretty much have signed on to that. Yes, next one, Pedro. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, go back again to that, I forgot. Yeah, so those are the similarities very broadly. In terms of, um, Broadly, again, the differences among the various schemes, we have contribution rates. They all have different levels of contribution rates. Um, Jamaica, I think, maybe is one of the lowest. It was recently 5.5%, but it recently got increased to 6%. On the other end, we have Barbados at about 18 or 18.3%. Uh, in terms of the normal pensionable age, we have it varies again. We have Grenada at age 60. Uh, we have Barbados on the other extreme at age 67. And then the, all, all the other schemes are somewhere in between. Most of them tend to be at age 65. If they are not currently at age 65, they are phasing into that particular age over the next few years to ultimately reach age 65. In terms of early retirement, some have it where you can retire early with or without the application of a um, reduction, but pretty much most now apply that early retirement reduction factor, okay? Um, I already alluded to the fact that the schemes around the region, they are at different states of maturity, different funded status, yeah? Um, now, when I spoke about similarities, that comprehensive benefit package, right? The short-term, long-term employment injury, everybody has that. But in addition, we have Barbados and Bahamas unique, hats off to them. They also, in addition to that, they have an unemployment insurance benefit program, okay? So 
which is fantastic. We'll talk about that a little bit further on some later slides. Uh, the insurable earning ceiling. So above that particular ceiling, the, um, you are not subject to, your, your earnings are not subject to the contribution rate. That varies right across the board. Investment strategy. Again, you're gonna have some of these schemes are heavily invested in local investments, local government bonds, local uh, securities. You may have some of them, yes, they are invested in local government bonds, but they also, a good bit of it also in regional government bonds, regional treasuries, et cetera. And then you have others such as, for instance, Turks and Caicos, they are heavily invested in equities, which is very different to many of the others um, in the region, which tend to go more, um, as I say, government bonds, these sort of fixed term local and regional. So that again, the investment strategy varies right across the region. And then of course, what stage are you in the development of your management information system? And that last point came in, was a crucial thing for many of them when, as we can see, as we will see, sorry, when COVID hit and everybody had to scramble to figure out how do I get my payments out without people physically coming in and by electronic means? And bearing in mind that you're talking about making pension payments to an elderly group who may never have seen a computer, did not grow up in this age. So we have to be very sensitive to that fact. Who, who, who are we um, really servicing at this point in time? Okay, so those are the key core similarities and differences. So the next slide is just a very um, quick to show you graphically pretty much what I just um, spoke about. We can see the contribution rates up in the top left-hand corner um, as a percentage of insurable earnings. On the, some of this information might be a little bit dated in terms of when I collected it. So for instance, I know Jamaica is now at 6%. Grenada um, recently went up to, from 9% to 11%. Um, but on average, the average contribution rate among those countries that you're seeing there, among those schemes, is about 10.6% of insurable earnings. So you can see who's above or below that average, right? Barbados at that 18.3%. And of course, there comes a point in time um, at, what, at what level of this contribution rate would insured persons feel, listen, I'm not going to pay anymore. This is it. Is it going to be 20%? Is it going to be 25%? Yeah. There's going to be some point in time they're going to push back and say no. Then if we look, if we go down at the, uh, to compare normal retirement ages, as I indicated, we have Grenada at 60 still and Barbados at 67. I think about at least seven of those countries, they have a NRA of 65 and the rest are gradually increasing to that in a very short term. In terms of administrative expenses, again, this is really, um, you know, there's a lot of variety here because you also have to remember too, there are a number of countries in here, such, <coughs> such as Turks and Caicos, St. Vincent, which are multi-island states. So to do the administration, I'm telling you, it really is a headache. Um, and certainly when you're small, it's harder to spread your cost. Um, but certainly on average, we're looking at um, administrative expenses being about 14% or so of contribution income. You would have Barbados is about 5% of their administrative expenses, about 5% of contribution income. But bear in mind their contribution income is that 18% that we spoke about. You have, I think Trinidad is about in that ballpark also. And then on the higher end, we have like Bahamas, um, some of these smaller OECS, Eastern Caribbean countries, their administrative expense 
maybe as high as about 20% of contribution income. But overall, the average is about 14%. Um, percent. Then, yeah, and you can see there's a wide um, range for the ceiling uh, among the various um, schemes in the region. Great. So that gives you um, a broad overview and comparison of the various schemes in the region. So we can now delve into, if you can move to the next slide, um, Pedro. Great. Impact of the pandemic on national insurance schemes in the region. Well, first and foremost, the first one is not unique to national insurance schemes in the region. This unexpected economic disruption. Everybody, all of a sudden, what is this thing called COVID-19? What is this pandemic? How do we adjust? How do we deal with it? Everybody's significant increase in unemployment throughout, right across the board. Some companies um, put the employees on furlough. You had other businesses that were already quite fragile pre-corona. And one close to me anyway, and I feel the effects of it is good old Leah that everybody used to cuss and quarrel about. It was the worst company, but I can bet your bottom dollar. We all wish it would come back right now. But that already, companies such as Aliat, and I'm sure there are many others around the region that were already um, teetering and quite fragile. I, once that um, pandemic hit, that just put them over the edge and that was it, full bankruptcy, okay? Um, so this was, as I say, NIS and all many other companies, this is what we had to deal with. So the various schemes had to be agile. How do we respond? How do we pivot our business to respond to the significant unemployment unexpectedly and the increase in um, sickness claims? And then of course, the fact that no matter whether we want to admit it, whether we like it or not, you have these um, schemes that they are viewed as cash cows to you know, governments, politicians, et cetera, and everybody else out there. They see these schemes sitting down with huge level of reserves, not quite comprehending. Listen, this money, it, the word is reserves, emphasis on that. We need this money for later on to pay for the increasing number of pensioners and amount of pensions. But that is how it is viewed. You know, people are short term in their, um, how can we fix this now? And there was an immediate view how can the NIS financially um, help out during this period of time? Or if not financially, maybe give administrative assistance, yeah? So we certainly looked at that. Um, and, you know, as I said, just generally, everybody, NIS included, had to change their business model. Um, how do we stop or limit the amount of people in person coming into the office? Um, how do we get these electronic payments? People, not necessarily everybody has a bank account. Um, how do we still collect our contributions, keep business going? How do we deal with all of these sick employees when we are short staffed? How do we get them to work safely? All of those issues that they had to juggle with. You would also have found that um, because of this sort of immediate liquidity need or certainly uncertain liquidity need, you found that some of these schemes postponed um, their planned capital um, expenditure, yeah, to deal with any liquidity needs that they had to right away. Further on, specifically, the next slide. Pedro? Yes, great, thank you. Um, continuing on on the impact of the pandemic, on the fund, on the income side, they would have all experienced a reduction in contribution income. Obviously, we have a whole number of people who are unemployed. Contribution income has gone down. Um, contribution weeks would have been reduced because people are unemployed. They cannot contribute. They cannot get credits, obviously, right? That will go towards determining their pension and all the other benefits and being eligible for all these other benefits. You're talking about reduced working hours. Um, we also have a reduction in the investment income and net income available 
for these schemes to invest, yeah? Lower investment returns. Um, we also have on the other side of it, of the, we have on the expenditure side. Now, all of a sudden, again, these schemes had to, well, when I say had to, well, the pressure was placed. They had to do their part and they implemented temporary unemployment benefit programs. Remember, we spoke about Barbados and Bahamas. They had permanent programs from years before. So they were, let's say, ready. All the other schemes in the region had to scramble and say, what, can, what unemployment benefits can we provide on a temporary basis? Right? Um, then in terms of the short-term sickness claims, on one hand, yes, those would have increased because all of a sudden you have people who are sick with COVID. We all went through various periods of surges with the COVID. So you have a lot of sickness claims coming in on one end, but also on the flip side, which you also had a number of people who now were unemployed because of the pandemic, and therefore they would have lost their recent attachment to the workforce, did not have contributions, um, were not making contributions recently, just prior to becoming un prior to becoming sick. So they were ineligible for a sickness benefit. So those two things may possibly um, negate each other, knock off each other, offset each other, sorry. Um, and a number of them too, a number of these schemes, even if the person did not have COVID, while they were in quarantine, they were able to make a claim and receive short-term sickness benefit. For that, um, to come, well, to help them out during that period, maybe they, uh, employer decide, look, I'm going to cut your pay while you're in quarantine or something to that effect. Um, you also had an increase, possibly an increase in administrative expenses um, impacted by, as I say, the investment in digitization. Not that maybe, I'm sure maybe a lot of these um, schemes were planning to do, to, to become more digitized with the administration, but now they really had to ramp it up and probably broaden the scope of it to meet everyone's needs. You have people working from home, um, reduced in-person services. You also would have had I, 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 um, where they may have saved administrative expenses in terms of less travel for the employees um, in that way. But on the flip side, they also then had to as we all know, um, implement all those COVID protocols, the hand washing, the um, getting their staff to work, shuttle to work in, in buses, they now have in or in vans and maybe in private um, vehicles to ensure they come in, um, staggering of staff. So we had that happening with the administrative expenses. So that's an overall of the impact of the pandemic on the various schemes in the region. What we will look to next is giving you specific examples. So, you know, great, thank you. Um, right, so specifically, we're gonna just look at a few of the countries, right? We have Grenada, pandemic hit. They were supposed to, I think um, they were supposed to put in, increase their contribution rate to 2%, but they said, hey, hold on. We don't know what's happening. Let's just postpone that. It was a temporary suspension. They ultimately did um, in, uh, adopt that 2%, but they did hold off on it for a little bit. The second thing with Grenada, yes, like many others, they offered a temporary unemployment benefit of about 330 per month for about a six month period. They spent about 10 million or so um, to registered individuals, including self-employed, regardless of income, you got a benefit, yeah? And bear in mind, this would have been the second time for Grenada that they had, that they offered a temporary um, unemployment benefit. The first time they did this was after Hurricane Ivan back in 2004. So they also did that where they spent about 2.5 million uh, giving benefits to about 36 insured persons. 
You also had just, not that I have it here, but Anguilla also had the same situation where they also offer temp, uh, temporary unemployment benefits after Hurricane Irma in 2017. So we kind of seen how these natural disasters, hurricanes and, and the pandemic are impacting these NISs, these schemes one way or the other. Um, also to Grenada, they found themselves forced to liquidate some of their fixed deposits, again, to ensure that they had sufficient liquidity to pay or out these unexpected demand on them for these benefits. All right. Um, then moving a little bit north, we have St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Similar sort of thing as Grenada. They offer this temporary unemployment benefit of about $300 a month. Um, I do remember initially they figured, well, I guess as many of us, who knew that we would be in the pandemic for three years, um, but certainly initially they figured, okay, we'll do, we'll set aside maybe about 1.5 million and we'll pay this out in benefits um, until the fund runs out or if we can make it further to, um, to about July or 2020 or so. Well, lo and behold, pandemic continued and continued, got worse and worse, and that did not work out. Ultimately, the uh, scheme ended up spending approximately um, about 10 million or so, um, and they had to extend benefits to about July of 2021, yeah? Um, so that was very unexpected for them, but certainly they, they did what they had to. And remember, all of these benefits we're talking about, these are non-contributory. So they're pulling out of their reserves to pay for these temporary unemployment benefits and nobody was funding for them directly, okay? Um, also to in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, they offered an income displacement program. This was done by the government now, funded by the government for seafarers and those in the hospitality industry, but it was administered by the NIS. So if you remember, I did say NIS gave the NISs across the region gave support financially and or administratively in terms of administrative support to any government programs. Right, we can now move, now we're going back south, <laughs> Trinidad. Right, Trinidad offered, basically was in two phases, a salary relief grant of about up to $1,500 per month, maximum of three months. I know they did extend it for another three months depending on your family situation, right? So it was possible you got another three months stay. Um, to all, anybody who was registered with the NIS, citizens, permanent residents, et cetera, yeah? Um, then they added on a phase two to, um, to cover self-employed persons, all persons registered and unregistered. The extension to include the unregistered was administered through the Ministry of Social um, Development. Yeah. Um, and I know Trinidad also had at the same time an in, uh, what they call an income support program. So they were very careful to let people know, listen, you cannot double dip. You cannot get the salary relief grant through the NS on one hand and the income support program, which was administered through the Ministry of Social Development. Yeah. So they were very sure about that. What they found too is that even though they had this for this three months or so, they then had to do another, paid it for an additional month in about May of 2021. So it was offered to persons who were um, terminated involuntarily, of course, due to COVID, suspended without pay during that March to June, that key time when COVID was hitting all of us. Right, and then we have Turks and Caicos again. They also offered a temporary unemployment benefits paid November of 2020 to October 2021. Approximately 12% of the insureds received this benefit, costing about 1.4% of their fund, non-contributory. Unlike the other schemes that we just spoke about, it was not a flat dollar benefit. What they offered was a 50% of average weekly insurable earnings for a period of about eight weeks. All right, they also gave a temporary waiver of late payment penalties, like they paid sickness benefit whilst you were quarantined, 
And as a result of this experience, Turks and Caicos is the only one I know so far has made the decision and they have adopted a permanent unemployment benefit program along with Barbados and Bahamas effective April 1st, 2022. And I think, but with benefits starting later um, October, but contributions will start in April. All right. Oh, let me move on very quickly. I saw the timekeeper. So next slide. Right. So I'm going to very quickly, I, we spoke about Barbados and Bahamas. So you can get a quick view of the Barbados versus the Bahamas um, unemployment program. Barbados offers slightly more generous benefits, 60% of, uh, of your insurable earning for 26 week period. However, they're charging you a little bit more. The contribution rate is one and a half percent. Bahamas is a little bit lower, the benefit rate 50%. They paid for a shorter period of time, 13 weeks, but similarly, their contribution is rate is lower at 1%. Now, with that, I am now going to hand over to my two other colleagues on the committee, Tammy Clark. She's very going to give you a quick overview because we have a time issue on Barbados' response to the COVID-19 and then after Tammy, Amanda will then follow up and talk about the Bahamas. And after that, you can hand back to me. Tammy. Good afternoon to all. Thank you for having me here. As my colleague Judy said, we are under time constraint. So we're just gonna speak briefly on Barbados. We won't be able to dive in as deep as we would like to, but we'll speak briefly. Next slide, Pedro, please. So at the onset of the 2019 global coronavirus pandemic, the government of Barbados outlined a set of strategic initiatives to guide Barbados through the COVID-19 storm. Some of these initiatives were the Barbados Employable Project, the Home for All Program, the Barbados Vulnerable Family Survival Program, Welfare Support, Household Survival, Adopt a Family, the BEST program, which is, stands for the Barbados Employment and Sustainable Transformation, and various NIS in, um, interventions, just to name a few. Now, as we stand amid 2022, in what some are saying is the tail end of the current COVID-19 pandemic, Barbados is still standing strong due in part to many creative interventions realized to date. Here are a few of them here on the screen. So there was government support, which was pledged, supplement support pledged to the National Insurance Scheme of Barbados to their unemployment benefit fund to cater for the unusual large volume of claims with unemployment benefits paid for six months in cases of full job losses, inclusive of a short time of short time workers. Short time workers being those vulnerable exposed persons, in the, especially in the tourism sector, who would have been working seasonally and will be direly in need of funds. Um, the NIS also provided a one-time business cessation benefit, which was paid to registered self-employed persons in the amount of 1,500 Barbados dollars per month during the period of April, 2020 and May, 2020 by NIS Barbados to just about 2,800 beneficiaries. And this totaled approximately 8.5 million Barbados dollars. NIS Barbados also implemented a program to employ, to assist employers and self-employed persons in liquidating their indebtedness to the National Insurance Fund. Under this current provision of the program, 100% of interest owed as at the 15th of March, 2022 will be waived in full if outstanding late payments of contributions owed are settled and paid up between the 1st of April this year, 2022, to the 30th of June, 2022. Also, a deferral was offered to employers, a deferral of employer contributions was offered to, was granted to employers during the pandemic for all registered employers retaining more than 75% of their staff complement, being able to defer employer contributions for an initial three months with the possibility 
of a further three months employer benefit deferral extension. Um, we also had a, additional strategies employed, such as NIS Barbados awarding sickness benefits to persons in quarantine or home isolation during the COVID-19 pandemic with respect to sickness claims being processed beginning from the 4th of February, 2022 to present. As seen in the slide, um, the, the next slide, we can see that information provided up to 2020 shows us that $155 million was paid out in benefits, in benefits in unemployment and sickness benefits to over 35,000 beneficiaries. And this 35,000 beneficiaries basically is approximately a quarter of our workforce here in Barbados. Um, these funds were paid in, were paid, these, these payments were made through the unemployment fund and there were also redemption of bonds, government bonds redeemed, which were on loan to also facilitate these payments. Um, from my research and uh, from information gained, even though that the National Insurance Unemployment Benefit Fund was totally exhausted, a creative measure of transferring of severance, the severance contribution percentage to the unemployment fund was implemented to ensure that persons will be paid during this period. Next slide, please. From our graphical slide seen above, be, uh, below, we can see the Barbados experience of the unemployment benefit fund. We can see that the fund between the years of 20, 2002 to 2008 was ranging in that expenditure between one and uh, 2%. We can see that there was a spike and an increase between 2008 and 2014, taking you between two and 3%. There was a dip between 2014 to 2017. And as expected, due to the pandemic, we can see a significant spike going all the way up close to 6% of expenditure between 2017 and 2020. As you would notice, contributions were consistent between the, the 20, 2002 period all the way through to 20, 2011 with a slight increase um, between at 2014 to 2017, and then teetering off as expected because of the various job losses, it the contributions rate would have teeter teetered off with the job losses. Based on the unemployment fund revenue, we can see that the from 1990 straight through to 1996, we can see there was a growth in the reserves. And from 1996 to 2008, you can see there was a maintenance of the reserve of just over $100 million. And then we can see then there was a significant drop in the reserves at 2014, all the way down to under 50 million. Um, we had an inflation um, an increase, and this was due to that um, severance to unemployment fund um, in uh, percentage contribution percentage, um, a grant a wave uh, allowance that the severance fund the funds from the severance contributions collected from the severance fund to be used to pay unemployment. So that created a spike and an increase in the reserves. And then due to the pandemic, you can see that the fund has dropped significantly, um, decreased to un or under over sorry, fifty million dollars deficit, but due to the ability of the supplementary support from government, we are able to still stand strong today. Amanda, over to you. Thank you, Tommy. We made unemployment payments through our four programs during the pandemic, three of which were government funded programs. As a result of Hurricane Dorian, the government funded an extension to the normal unemployment benefits of up to an additional 13 weeks for claimants on affected islands. 
This means that claimants received up to 26 weeks of benefits. The government funded two unemployment programs as a result of the pandemic. The first program covered self-employed persons, since our program doesn't cover these persons. This program ran from April 2020 to June 2020. Over 7,000 persons were paid 15.6 million. The second program covered four categories of persons. Those who exhausted their 13 weeks of unemployment benefits. Self-employed persons in the tourism sector, this allowed persons and Hurricane Dorian claimants. This program ran from July 2020 to December 2021. Over 30,000 persons were paid 203.2 million. In addition, we had a stimulus payment of $500 that was made in December 2020 to some 13,000 recipients, and that amounted to 6.6 million. The planned digital agenda was projected to initially be phased in over a two year period. This was accelerated and completed within a month of the shutdown. In order to administer the government funded unemployment programs, our in house IT team designed and implemented a digital platform to receive applications solely online. This Innovation was the first of its kind, and it was, has become a model for similar portals in the future. In addition, we expanded payment methods to our unbanked and underbanked claimants. Next slide, please. The three charts did show recent unemployment benefit experience for the Bahamas. The first chart shows the unemployment expenditure as a percent of insurable wages. The cost of unemployment benefit remained relatively stable up until the pandemic hit in 2020, where you see the spike in the graph. The five-year average cost for 2015 to 2019 was 0.46% of insurable wages. In 2020, the cost spiked at 4.62%, with the national unemployment rate rising to over 25%. The second chart shows the number of claims awarded for unemployment benefits. Again, we observe a spike in 2020. For 2015 to 2019, the annual average number of claims were approximately 6,500. In 2020, over 44,000 recipients were paid. In order to process this unprecedented increase in claims, we develop expedited unemployment claims processing, mainly for large hospitality sector employers. Additionally, we had cross-training of staff to process these claims, direct, de direct deposit payments for unemployment claims. Pre-COVID, checks had to be collected in person. We waived the Department of Labor unemployment certification step in the payment process. We allowed claims to be submitted via email, via email or the Dropbox, and a temporary site was established for check collection. In the final chart, we see unemployment benefits paid in 2020. We can see that in 2020, the expenditure climbed to 108 million. To understand the extent of the increase, Let's look at the unemployment expenditure for 2015 to 2019. The average expenditure was approximately 13 million. Did we have sufficient reserves to cover the cost? The fund has been running deficits since 2016. This deficit for 2020 further widened with the decline in contribution income due to fewer workers, the decline in investment income, and the increase in expenditure due to unemployment. Our, our reserve is split into four branches. Unemployment benefit shares the short-term benefits branch reserve for sickness, maternity, and funerals. Despite this un 
unprecedented high expenditure, the short-term benefits branch res reserve was sufficient to cover the cost. I now hand it over to Judy. Thank you. Right, great. Thank you very much, um, Tammy and Amanda, for giving us real specific details on these two particular countries that have had un permanent unemployment programs for some years. Um, all the others in the region, we can certainly learn from their experience if and when we too adopt a permanent unemployment insurance program. And specifically, I just want to, there's a World Bank report. It can be sourced, it was sourced from the Nassau um, Guardian newspaper. Also, it's on the caricom.org website, where it specifically says Barbados leads the region in protecting citizens during the pandemic through unemployment benefits, delivering payments to 90% of unemployed workers. That's really fantastic while the Bahamas captured about 26%. So that's just a little tidbit. Um, in terms of the outlook for the regional going forward, for the regional um, schemes, of course, you're gonna have some reduction in future pension benefits because of the loss of contribution weeks while it's unemployed. Um, I think there should be, I would expect, hopefully, um, a, an increased appreciation for NIS benefits and possibly an increase in compliance. I would like to think certainly even among the self-employed, they realize, shucks, I really should be um, contributing to the NIS and contributing on a consistent basis. Because you never know, I may need um, short-term sickness benefit. You never know there's another pandemic. Maybe this may encourage others to step up and be um, active contributors to their respective uh, NIS scheme. Um, you may find some of the countries that have a large expat workforce, they would have lost, obviously a lot of them would have lost their jobs, especially the tourist industry. Um, they may have gone back to their home countries. Are they going to come back? That remains to be um, seen. And if we don't get them back, we lose their contribution income that we had expected to get in future years. Um, also, too, there is the um, temporary unemployment benefits um, may, may have reduced the sustainability of some NIS funds, right? May have. It, again, time will tell. Barbados and Bahamas, again, I'm sure those particular schemes, and maybe especially Barbados, where they saw their reserves going negative for their unemployment insurance fund, take a step back and look at okay, did we prepare ourselves sufficiently? Who, I mean, who does for a pandemic? And ensure, uh, is our contribution rate still at an acceptable level? Is it um, consistent with the benefits being offered? Do we need to make any changes? I think somewhere Bar Barbados right now, um, they have no plans, but I'm sure the respective actuaries for those two countries will delve into that matter in greater detail in the coming years. Also, too, out of this, I gave the example with Turks and Caicos. A lot of them, Turks and Caicos, is now definitely, they've put in a permanent unemployment insurance program. And I know there are a number of others in the region who are looking into the feasibility of it now. Maybe they will get on board. So on that very quick note, if we can just move on to the next slide, just to continue that <clears throat> last bullet point, Pedro, just to give everybody just a quick overview, anybody who's thinking of putting in a... Um, permanent unemployment design. And this would be very consistent for what you're seeing in Barbados and um, Bahamas and Turks and Caicos, right? So it will be anybody is an insured person who involuntarily lost their, involuntarily lost their jobs due, due to socioeconomic conditions. Typically self-employed persons are not um, part of it because they are able, they are assumed to be able to control just about all aspects of their employment. Okay, so they're not covered. In terms of if you are eligible for a benefit, you can you will can contribute to the unemployment insurance fund, but you don't necessarily get a benefit from it. You get a benefit from it if you have lost your job, as I indicated, but also to if at the time you have lost a job. Did you pay consistently into the unemployment insurance fund? And did you have a recent significant attachment to the workforce just prior to you becoming unemployed? Okay, so that is critical. In terms of when the benefit is paid, typically there's going to be a waiting period. Barbados, Bahamas, they have a three-day waiting period. 
It could be maybe a max of seven days. That allows a period of time somebody comes un unemployed, but then next thing you know, they go get a job. And you, would, you don't want to waste your time processing claims for these individuals. So you have that waiting period. Generally, if you're going to put in this sort of program, um, the benefit could be anywhere from 50 to 60% of average weekly insurable earnings. That's very common. It could also be a flat rate benefit. Benefit duration, about 13 weeks in a 52-week period. I think Barbados was 26 weeks, if I remember correctly. Um, contribution rate, anywhere about from 1% to 2% of insurable earnings, and it will be shared equally, equally between the employee and the employer. Also take note that only about one third of the countries, only one third of the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean have uh, offer a national unemployment income support plan. Argentina, Bahamas, Barbados, Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela are just some examples of the few who offer unemployment insurance program um, here in the Latin America, Caribbean region. Okay, so, um, if we, and of course, these unemployment programs will offer good safety net during periods of economic inactivity. All of a sudden, you've lost your job because of such events. It offers a counter cyclical effect during periods of high unemployment by facilitating the continuation of consumer spending, at, at least at some level, and transfer of wealth from the employed to the unemployed. If we can move on, Pedro, so we can just get to the last two slides in terms of outlook. Um, for regional NISs, certainly in the short to medium term, I think they can all expect lower investment income. I think they would have some concern in terms of their investments. Remember, we said a lot of them are heavily investment, invested sorry, in government bonds. Um, and now these governments, they were under a lot of financial pressure during the pandemic, right? Because all of a sudden they had to increase poor relief, pay various benefits, help out their citizens. Um, they also saw... Uh, a reduction in their revenue stream because businesses were not doing so well. So there's always that risk. Will those government bonds possibly default or delay in their payment of their, um, for their bond payments, right? So the NIS is because they're invested in these governments, there's some um, credit risk to them too. I think all the NIS is now, I would like to think we're on the tail end, fingers crossed, of this um, pandemic and we're going to get some sense of normalcy in this year's 2023 and I'm sure they will all take the opportunity to look back what happened during the past three years what could we have done better can we prepare for the future and is this going to affect in any significant way our actual projections and of our cash flows that we've done for the next 50 to 60 years they may possibly find the answer is no but they still certainly have to do that assessment um, certainly because of the period of protracted period of um, unemployment that was experienced during the past three years, there's going to be lower than expected contribution income. Um, it is also, the pandemic has also exposed the financial vulnerability of self-employed persons. Um, and they were just quite frankly darn lucky that a number of these NISs and governments, because certainly under the NISs, self-employed persons are not eligible technically theoretically for unemployment benefits, but many of them registered, unregistered, they still got some sort of relief. Oh my goodness, Pedro, you're killing me. Very last one, last, last slide. Very last slide, I'm gonna close up now. So overall the changes in the cash flow resulting from the pandemic are not expected to materially impact the long-term financial sustainability and ultimate cost of the scheme. Pre-corona, pre-COVID-19, um, I said corona, pre-COVID-19, whatever reforms that these schemes had to, were planning to adopt, they're still going to have to do it. And they may also have to do it a little bit more aggressively and hasten it a little bit more to offset any short-term consequences of the pandemic. So maybe if they were going to adopt certain changes, increasing the contribution rate, reducing their benefits, et cetera, Maybe they were planning to do it within the next three years. Maybe they may have to do that now in the next two years, right? To counteract whatever happened this um, because of the pandemic and the increased benefits they had to pay out and reduce contribution income, reduce investment income. So it does beg the question in, in the end of it, will, and I, will these national insurance schemes have to give more in-depth consideration to these one-off significant events such as the pandemic 
volcanic eruptions, which was affected St. Vincent and Barbados, the hurricanes that we get and other natural disasters when assessing our long-term financial sustainability. And certainly the requests that are ultimately being made by the governments for administrative assistance and or financial support. So with that, I'm going to thank you very much. Um, in the thing, in the appendix, we're not going to go into that, there are where there's more detail about the various countries in terms of what they did for the pandemic. But we're not going to present on that. And I will open if we have any time, if Pedro will allow us. Um, any questions? And the questions can be posed to any one of us on the Social Security Subcommittee, myself, Tammy, Amanda, Derek, or Simon. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the floor is open. I, I see some here in the chat, so I don't know. Um, no, no, okay. Okay, there were a few questions that were posted in the Q&A. I think um, Simone did a, a great job responding to some of those questions. I just okay. see that um, Teofanis raised his hand. Um, actually, took it down. <laughs> So you said Simon answered some of the questions already, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so what I could do, there was a, a question um, that was prepared ahead of time, um, just to see if anyone had any concerns about their current um, national insurance scheme. Um, so I could do is I could pose that question to the audience. Yes. Well. So I'll watch that. Okay, so I've launched that um, question to see what the responses are. Response is maybe a little slow as there's a lot to read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so while persons ask that question, um, one of the attendees asks, will there be a follow-up on actual projections? I'm sure we could consider that, and that's why um, these poll questions will really help guide the Social Security Subcommittee in terms of what we do next, you know, if we do any other webinars, and certainly with the upcoming um, conference coming up in Barbados at the end of the year. So we can certainly look into that if there's certainly interest, yeah. We can become more tactical in our information. Okay. All right. So then there's another question here. Why not use admin expense compared to benefit payments as a measure of efficiency? Um, some do that. I think in the chart that I presented, I showed admin expense as a percentage of benefits and contributions. And benefits and contributions tends to be the, because of, um, that is the workload of the scheme. They are paying out benefits, they're collecting contributions. So that's a very sort of typical way of measuring administrative ex, um, expenses. So sometimes you'll see it presented as that, what they would call the administrative index, the admin expense re, as, a, as a percentage of benefits plus contributions. But I also wanted to, that's in the graph, but I also wanted to present it in maybe more relatable as a percentage of contribution um, income. Yeah, so it could be presented in all ways. Okay. All right. Another question just came in. I'm not sure if you want Amanda or Tammy to take this one. What actions have you seen around the region to boost funds other than increased contributions? Or maybe, given that we haven't heard um, Derek as yet, maybe Derek might want to take this one yes. as well. Yes, I agree. Derek? Hi, everybody. I'm getting getting set here. So there's not much else that can be done um, directly. Of course, you can invest differently, but as Judy mentioned, many of the funds are facing depletion within the next, some as early as five, six years, maybe some 15 years. And you have to be very worried about, about where to invest for higher returns. And also the higher returns at this stage won't make much of a difference 
in the long term outlook. So contribution income really is the is the way to increase revenue, but benefit reforms are the way to reduce long term costs. Okay, with that, yeah. Um, so no other questions right now in Q and A, but I can give a summary of the um, response. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. So around, I'll end the poll now, so I can actually share the results. So 40% of, well, actually, so these are not going to total 100, given that it was um, multiple answers were allowed. Um, but 40% of persons um, did indicate that the old age uh, pension retirement benefits um, being inadequate to maintain a decent standard of living is a, is a concern. Um, we had about 38 persons who said all of the above. <laughs> Um, a quarter of the person says that the NAS fund will be depleted in the short to um, medium term. So I'm not sure if the panel wants to give any feedback on the main concerns that person's highlighted. Right. Well, what I just find is interesting that everybody had a concern. Um, and what is also good that I'm getting from this is one of the concerns is everybody seems to be fairly confident in the respective boards and that are administering and the management of their respective NISs. So that's good in terms of having confidence in the system. Um, but other than that, let me see, um, that old age pension will be inadequate. Yeah, um, and certainly that is a concern because remember the very beginning I indicated, for many people that's all they're gonna have to rely on. They won't necessarily have um, a pension from the uh, employer or even their own private savings. So, um, and I guess people foresee that with the aging of the population, um, at some point, um, these NISs may possibly start to cut back and say that's one of the reform measures we have to adopt. So we certainly, those poll questions are really great. That's gonna guide us. Um, and certainly in our work going forward, yes. Okay, so we have time to squeeze in one last quick question. Um, are all of these schemes somewhat regressive in that benefits are paid on the same earnings as contributions? Same earnings? Derek, what is it? On the same earnings as contributions? I'll repeat, it. I'll repeat it one more time. Are all of these schemes somewhat regressive in that benefits are paid on the same earnings as contributions? I'm not sure I'm clear, but all I would say is that every scheme, every country has a different ceiling, right? And above that ceiling, no contribution rate is applied. So every, every, every country, every scheme has a different um, situation. And I, I'd shown that in um, one of the graphs and they're all pretty much, you're gonna get 30% of your average insurable earnings. And when I say insurable earnings, it's your earnings up to that ceiling amount. And so after about maybe the first 10 years, you're going to get about 30%. And as you continue to contribute, um, after 35, 40 years of contributions, you could possibly get as high as 60%. Um, so it's front loaded, as I'd indicated, right across the board, they're all, they're all the same. Okay. So but I, I, but I was... wants to add, yeah, go ahead. I was going to add that yeah. follow on that said they bear more heavily on the poor, no additional contributions by higher earners. So I think that was additional clarity that was provided to the question. Okay. I think Derek wanted to say something. Yeah, briefly. So having a minimum pension actually makes it slightly progressive where lower income people who don't earn uh, the minimum pension will get bumped up to the minimum pension. And so I wouldn't say it's regressive because they pay the same contributions and, and benefits are based on, but slightly progressive for those at the lower end. Okay. All right, there's one more question in Q&A, but we are unfortunately out of time. Yeah. Um, so at this stage. 
Yeah, so people will have access to the information in the appendix on the last two slides. We try to collect as much information as possible if you want it. Yeah. All right. Um, so thank you everyone for joining uh, today's webinar. I would like to say a special thank you to the panelists as well, Judy Vera, Tammy Clark, Amanda Darville, Derek Osborne, and Simone Bakasun. Simone sent her apologies as she had to leave to attend another session. Um, so after today, we will make the, vi the video available um, on our YouTube page. Um, we also make the presentation available to you, the slides, and you will also receive a post-event survey. So we look forward to receiving your feedback. If there are any questions that are submitted now and that we weren't able to address, I'll share them with the panel so that they can actually send you a response. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for who's helping us out here, Patreon team. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, and thank you every, all the attendees too for participating. Thank you.